progress. We'll get things started. Um, it's nice to see a few folks that tuned in for this program and appreciate the students from Cornell for putting it together. Like I say, we'll put this on YouTube and I'm sure that some other folks will see it. Um, anybody that's on other than the presenter should probably keep in mind um, muting until the end of the program and then then we can do some question and answer i imagine and um i want to thank the students from the bmes uh which stands for the bioengineering biomedical engineering society um for agreeing to do this for us and um uh, i've been speaking with cole latvis and madeline prez Pritz, um, setting this up. Uh, I see a few student names that I don't haven't interacted with, but welcome to to you all. And um, uh, as you guys present, just let me know when you'd like me to change the the slide verbally, and and I'll try to keep up. If, if we run into problems, I'll turn over hosting duties to one of you. But uh, we'll start off like that. So. Welcome. Thank you. Give me, give me one second and I'll get the share. Um, the presentation started. You see on that? Yep, it looks great. Right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. As Zach mentioned, we're from the Biomedical Engineering Society at Cornell, and we're excited to present with, uh, for you today some information on cardiovascular health. Uh, so I'm Cole, and our other speakers are Nathaniel, Maggie, and Ben. You can go ahead to the next slide. So although each of us studies biomedical science uh, in one avenue or another, we're not medical professionals, not medical doctors. Uh, so we can only provide uh, information. We cannot provide recommendations or real advice. If you're looking for that, we recommend you speaking with a doctor. So what are cardiovascular diseases? Uh, this is any disorder of the heart or blood vessels, and they include many of the diseases we're going to be talking about today, including arthrosclerosis, stroke, heart attack, hypertension, and uh, uh, aortic valve diseases. And why we care about them is cardiovascular diseases as a whole are the leading causes of death worldwide, um, with many of, of the key cardiovascular diseases you can see in this plot um, leading the top of the world's leading causes of death. So learning about them and understanding how, how these diseases work and how you can avoid them um, can be very helpful for your health. So the first disease that we want to talk about is atherosclerosis, which is characterized by the buildup of plaque in the arteries. Now, when we mean arteries, we're basic, we're more commonly referencing the arteries leading away from the heart or the oxygenated blood that is carried away from the heart to the various parts of the body, be it up towards your brain or other organs or even towards your leg. So this oftentimes this condition is more manifest when it occurs within the heart to the heart itself. But because of that, it can go undiagnosed for many years as not as there is not an easy way to check for this disease at every checkup for us. It can lead to stroke, heart attack, and other serious problems over time, however. So great care must be taken to try and prevent it if possible, but also we need to understand some of the risk factors. And so to educate you about them, they tip risk factors for a lot of these diseases will look similar and they'll be include dietary habits, um, if you have diabetes or any level of insulin resistance, a uh, lack of physical activity, and a family history of heart disease can also help contribute. A 
age and also stress, be it a level of stress over an extended period of time or one specific event can also increase risk of these diseases. And so next slide. Um, some of the treatments for atherosclerosis include statins, which may, which are often prescribed, which is basically just a, a general cholesterol me medication. There's also blood thinners that can be used and blood pressure medication. And this is basically to alleviate the blood's like possible continual clotting through blood thinners or blood pressures that will cause vessels to burst around these areas of plaque buildup in the arteries and other vessels of the cardiovascular system. So procedures that are done to alleviate these symptoms are a coronary angioplasty, which is visualized here at the right. So what is done is a catheter is inserted through either the arm or the groin area and ran up to the heart. These catheters can then uh, deploy a balloon, a balloon that holds a stent onto it and, and push the plaque and the buildup away from the artery to increase flow. However, over time, these stents will again become um, occluded if not dealt with properly. A keratoid and, and our um, Arterectomy is a different procedure in which the plaques leading up to the brain are destroyed or disturbed, which helps prevent risks of stroke later off when these plaques break off. So, and another treatment is the fibrinolytic therapy, which is basically just helping to break down the plaques through various medications that induce um, so blood thinners are an example of something that would be an example. Uh, coronary artery bypass surgery is basically when you take an artery from a different part of the body, such as the leg, and they place it over in place of the occluded artery and connect it around it in order for blood to flow. So all of these procedures can be done. However, they often, they take a lot of time and we want to avoid it if possible. Next slide. So talking about, I mentioned stroke er, earlier with how plaques can break up off. There are a few different types of strokes to be aware of though. Typically when we say stroke, we think of ischemic stroke, which is basically when one of these plaques break off and they go to a vessel within the brain and they get lodged into that section and they can no longer proceed. In that case, the blood flow is prevented from flowing to that part of the brain in which that part of the brain dies. So that would be this right figure here with the plaque that's lodged into this vessel. And that's about 87% of the strokes. The hem hemorrhagic stroke is what's displayed here on the left of the figure in which part of the blood vessel bursts, which could be from blood pressure or other causes. Off and the third type is a transient ischemic attack where something gets lodged, but eventually it dislodges itself after a certain period of time. How, so when it comes to strokes, while we talk about them, it's important to recognize these symptoms and to get seek proper medical attention as soon as possible. Numbness on one side of the body is especially telling. Numbness in general can be a sign, but especially on one side of the body, trouble speaking or understanding speech suddenly, or loss of coordination and dizziness. And uh, all of these can be signs that a stroke has occurred or is occurring. And the faster you are able to seek medical attention, they are better able to alleviate long-term um, downsides or different side effects that may occur. So please recognize the symptoms, keep them in mind, and uh, seek medical attention if necessary. Uh, so now I will talk a little bit about hypertension, uh, which is more commonly known as high blood pressure. So hypertension is um, an increased outward pressure on the blood vessels, 
So normally when you get your blood pressure taken, the expected number is around 120 over 80. Um, hypertension can be classified as anything greater than 130 over 90 or 140 over 100, depending on which doctor you talk to. Uh, there are two different kinds of hypertension. Uh, so primary hypertension more often comes up or about as a result of um, certain lifestyles and age. So maybe that's diet, maybe that's, uh, you know, certain exercise choices. Um, and then there's secondary hypertension, which is more frequently a result of specific diseases or maybe side effects of a certain medication you may be taking. Uh, so while there's these two different kinds of hypertension, they have very similar symptoms, uh, which include shortness of breath and nosebleeds. Um, however, symptoms are relatively rare in mild cases. So if you are observing these symptoms in combination with high blood pressure, uh, it usually means there's a more advanced case. So because of that, it's best to be proactive. If this is something you're concerned about, it's a good idea to get in touch with a doctor because high blood pressure is relatively easy to test for. Um, I think most of the time anyone goes to a doctor, you get your blood pressure checked. So it's definitely a good idea to stay on top of this. Um, next slide, please. So there are a few different treatments for hypertension. Like I mentioned, sometimes it does come about as a result of certain lifestyle choices. So changes in your lifestyle, including reducing salt in your diet, changing your exercise habits, and limiting alcohol consumptions are common recommendations from doctors. Um, similarly, there are a number of medications, including diuretics, which relax your blood vessels, angiotensin regulators, and calcium channel blockers which also both help relax your blood vessels and um, can slow your heart rate and then alpha beta blockers and vasodilators, which um, all on this, this similar pathway to reduce your risk of hypertension by you know, relaxing your heart, relaxing your blood vessels um, and helping eliminate certain salts from your body that may lead to the development of this disease. Uh, next slide, please. Hi. Um, so in terms of like other diseases that can affect your heart, um, a heart attack. What actually is a heart attack? Um, it's characterized by a lack of blood flow to the heart muscle. Your heart is in fact one very big, strong, consistently pumping muscle. Um, and like all muscles, it needs blood, it needs oxygen, it needs lots of nutrients and sugars to keep it going. Um, and for a number of reasons, blood flow to the heart muscle can be lost. So the most common one is coronary artery disease, where the um, blood vessels that actually give your heart all the nutrients it needs becomes blocked by cholesterol. Um, and then like blood clots can fit into the small gap that's left there and reduce blood flow to the heart. Um, that's very common, um, pretty much that's like all of the cases. There are very rare cases where the coronary artery, um, it will spasm and close. Um, again, those are very rare and it's treated slightly differently, but we'll go over that later. Um, and so symptoms of heart attack, the most common one is the very like well-known like grabbing at your chest because there's pain in your chest that feels like something is squeezing your heart, squeezing your chest in. Um, this tension in the chest is actually more common in men than women. It's still the most common symptom, um, but it's slightly less common in women. This pain and discomfort can also be in the upper body, so up to the neck um, and in your arms and shoulders. Um, so the pain isn't actually just to the chest. Um, along with that, there's feelings of weakness and fatigue. Fatigue isn't just tiredness, it's like inability to do the basics. Like you're too tired to lift up your glass of water or something like that. Um, and then also a cold sweat or shortness of breath. Um, are also symptoms of a heart attack. Next slide. So there are many ways to treat heart attacks. Um, the, like the ones that are listed here are basically all to address the um, cases of coronary artery disease in which the blood vessel to the uh, heart has gotten thinner because it's been blocked and then a blood clot's in there. Um, so these all serve to thin the blood break down the plaque, break down, break down a blood clot, 
Um, and also pain management drugs, aspirin. Aspirin is actually frequently used um, when somebody's having a heart attack because that can also um, break up the conditions of coronary artery disease. And it's like the paramedics get there. That's like one of the first things that they'll give somebody because it's one of the easiest things to give somebody. And in terms of the procedures, like once somebody's in a hospital, um, so uh, coronary angioplasty, the stent placement, that's essentially like cleaning out the clog that's in your uh, arteries at that point. Um, Nathaniel illustrated it earlier. It's very simple of um, a catheter goes in, it deploys what looks like chicken wire to like push everything back and create an opening for blood to go through. Um, and like also then it's basically cleaning out and clearing a clog. The coronary artery bypass surgery, it's in the name where it's a bypass. Um, they'll essentially take uh, a fat, like vascular tissue or from somewhere in your body um, and use that to uh, bypass the uh, clogged artery that is supposed to be like servicing your heart muscle. Um, and so not on this slide, but uh, the other type of heart attack with the spasm of the coronary artery, there's a couple things that can be done for that. Um, one, there's basically just muscle relaxants um, to relax the spasm in that um, artery that's causing it to like just tense up and close. Um, much less common, but it is treatable as well. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and so after a heart attack, you have to rehab your heart. You, um, there are a couple things that you can do for this. Um, there's medication that you can take to make sure that new clots are not forming. Uh, your heart will be weak after uh, a heart attack. So you have to make sure that clots aren't forming, that blood is still moving at the appropriate speed and with the appropriate, um, and with the appropriate pressure lifestyle changes. All of the things that can prevent a heart attack can also help you rehabilitate after a heart attack. Um, so lifestyle changes such as being more active, you see the heart here on a bicycle, um, but being more active, having a healthier um, diet, um, certain lifestyle changes regarding alcohol or tobacco use can um, be a part of rehabilitation. Um, mental and emotional regulation, actually. So stress is known as the silent killer. Um, stress after a heart attack, obviously a heart attack is quite stressful. We all have lots of stress in our lives. Um, and so when getting back to normal after you're having a heart attack, you really want to make sure that you're protected from um, moments of extreme stress and having lots of support systems in place so that you don't have too much going on at once um, and you can focus on getting better. And why do we do all of these things? People who have heart attacks are actually still at increased risk for another heart attack and then several other, um, several other cardiovascular diseases as well. Because again, your heart just went through a lot um, it's struggling to do its basic job. And a lot of things depend on your heart doing its basic job. Um, so you're at higher risk for kidney disorders, stroke, and peripheral artery disease, in which it's just a blockage of um, arteries in your limbs. Um, so doing all of these things can help prevent further damage um, to other parts of your body as well. And you get it'll help you live longer and have a higher quality of life because these other complications won't be coming into play. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so prevention. Um, we obviously want to prevent heart attacks. We want to prevent any of this from happening in the first place. Um, and there are things that we can do for that. So the first is exercise. We don't have to be running marathons here, um, just walking for 30 minutes a day, um, making sure that you're just not having sedentary lifestyle. A lot of our jobs mean that we're sitting down a lot, making sure that we're getting up, going for walks, going for a jog, some yoga, um, lifting weights even lightweights, any of that is, uh, can have like a really big impact on reducing your risk for heart disease um, and cardiac arrest. Um, healthy diet, um, whatever that healthy diet, just having balanced diet, um, fewer added sugars, fewer trans fats, um, really the basics um, of making sure that like omega-3s, making sure that you're having um, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, um, and honestly, just like fewer artificial, fewer artificial sugars um, is a huge part of that. Smoking, smoking and vaping, um, tobacco use in general, it causes a lot of stress to your body, not just in terms of your cardiovascular system, 
it messes up your joints, it messes up your lungs, it puts you at risk for many types of cancer. All of this is because of the stress it causes in the body, which can affect your heart and your cardiovascular system. So um, quitting smoking, um, not starting vaping is very important. Um, maintaining a healthy weight is part of healthy diet and exercise um, and reducing stress sustainably. Again, just uh, setting up uh, systems in your life so that you are able to um, manage the stresses of life in a sustainable way. But again, talk with a doctor to find out what is best for you. All of us have a different profile of health. All of our lives look different. So talking to a doctor um, is uh, definitely the first step. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the cardiovascular research at the University of uh, Cornell University. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. So in the long lab, we're working on next generation of vascular grafts. So as Maggie talked about the coronary artery bypass, she mentioned how you would take a vessel from another part of the body. They may not always be available. So as an alternative, uh, synthetic grafts would be used instead. Uh, and in the long lab, we're working on grafts that uh, better match the mechanical properties of your native vessels and potentially over time can degrade and be replaced with your own tissue to provide a repaired vessel. Uh, additionally, uh, others in this lab are working on drug delivery of drugs that can help the heart regenerate after a heart attack, uh, particularly making sure that these, heart, that these drugs when administered can last longer in the body through these uh, unique drug loading methods, as you can see on the right. Next slide, please. Um, within the butcher lab, they study mostly the heart, particularly heart valves. So they look at the mechanical and chemical causes for uh, valve diseases. Or for instance, they can calcify over time if the conditions are not correct. Um, and in addition to just studying it, they're also working on making replacement heart valves um, that can be put into place of damaged heart valves uh, in the future. Next slide, please. The Intaki lab looks at mechanical devices that are put into the vascular system. For instance, this is a picture of a, of a heart assisting device that helps push the blood through your, through your circulatory system. And they look at how these devices can react to the blood in, in bad ways in order to form blood clots and how that can be avoided in the future. All right, well, oh. Uh, <laughs> Oh, next slide, please. And then there's the, the Schaefer uh, Ishimura lab where they, they work with special microscopes that can image the heart and blood vessels in living organisms. Here is depicted the, the vasculature of a mouse and they use this to study uh, the, the development of blood vessels and how it can go wrong leading to various vascular diseases so we can better understand the causes of diseases and how to treat them. Next slide, please. So thank you all for coming and um, learning a little bit about medical literacy with us. If you have any questions, we'll stick around. Uh, and there's also the, our Cornell BMES outreach email if you have any additional questions. Thank you. Does anybody want to jump in with a question here? I can, I can start one out. Uh, I've got a question about diet. Um, I, I mean, it's pretty well known that red meat versus uh, like fish and poultry is is um, um, a risk fast risk factor for for um, cardiovascular disease. I'm wondering um, uh, what about the red meat makes it um, what, what differentiates it from other kinds of meats and, and why that is? Um, I, can, I can talk about that a little. So red meat is known to have a certain kind of um, saturated that is commonly associated with high cholesterol levels. Um, so there's two different kinds of cholesterol and certain like meats and other sort of like fats um, uh, 
uh, similar to like or like avocados that are just like healthy fat have what's not good cholesterol. Uh, that the meat is has these fats that do increases in what's called bad cholesterol. Uh, and that's differentiating factor there. So, um, can I talk about um, this velocity? Uh, what about hereditary and heart and heart heart disease? If many people in your family have had heart attacks, how how does that increase your risk of having a heart attack? I can start on that. Um, so genetic factors play a big role in heart disease for a number of reasons. One is that um, blood pressure, there's a lot you can do to affect your blood pressure, but a lot of it is genetic. Um, I think every woman in my family has super low blood pressure um, just to start with at baseline. And that's one of the big factors for um, basically how your heart reacts to a lot of things. Um, so that's one aspect of it. In terms of like what makes these genetic differences, uh, that I'm honestly not quite sure about. Um, like, I don't know what gene regulates that. We're not exactly close to any sort of way to affect those genes or do gene therapy or anything like that. Um, but so genetics are tightly strong to blood pressure. There's also um, genetic disorders in terms of uh, the signaling to the heart. So your heart gets the stimulus to beat from nerves. Um, issues with those nerves are commonly um, passed down. Um, there are a number of people in my family who, um, like there are a number of people in my family who like have slight heart ticks and those are actually very frequently genetic. Um, and so those can be passed down as well. There are tests for those um, that are usually done by, a, basically you just wear like a couple of sensors all over your chest and then you run around for a while. And then if there is an issue with your heart and your heart beats and the, uh, like the electrical components of your heart, it comes out in those uh, tests. Um, but uh, again, genetics affect a lot of things. I think the big ones would be um, the way that your heart responds to electricity uh, that causes its beating um, and the overall blood pressure across your whole body um, is usually where that comes in. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Also, uh, if you're prone to having clots in your body, does that, uh, does that uh, affect, is that hereditary? Does that affect the fact that you might have a heart attack? Certainly. There are various, like, obviously, different genetic um, traits that affect the different clotting cascades and those different factors to regulate those cascades. Obviously, I, if you have any genetic like dysfunction in any of those areas, and these are very in like complex networks with many moving pieces, so there are small factors that can change those, which can increase your risk. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if any research, can you hear me? Okay. Any research has been done that uh, indicates that medicinal approaches to the reduction of stress, such as an antidepressant or anti-anxiety, can be beneficial when someone who has cardiovascular problems finds themselves in extremely stressful situations that can't be mitigated. Have they dis have they found that taking medication to reduce anti-anxiety has been helpful? So I'm not particularly aware of any uh, particular studies that have looked at that. That doesn't okay. mean that they don't exist, but um, it is well known as, as I think was pointed out in the in the presentation that having high stress can increase your risk of like a heart attack and, and many of these other cardiovascular diseases. Right. Um, and, and many, much of that is like, it's like linked to high blood pressure that's associated with high stress levels. Um, so I, 
Well, I've not seen a paper particularly looking at that. I imagine that different measures that can reduce your stress levels um, may help you manage or prevent uh, heart uh, cardiovascular problems. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just as an aside, along with what Cole said, is some of the medica medications themselves will have cardiovascular events, like adverse events as side effects. So that's why the doctors have to be aware of your medical conditions when prescribing them. Okay, thank you. So uh, if you were to recommend the single greatest um, uh, the single best lifestyle change to improve your cardiovascular health. What what would be number one on on the list? I would say probably uh, eating healthier, limit, limiting sodium intake, um, limiting bad cholesterol intake. Um, just because the the high sodium levels directly can lead to high blood pressure and the, the high cholesterol and fat levels can, well, not directly, more directly lead to the buildup of plaques in your arteries that can then become a stroke um, down the line if they're not managed. I see, go ahead, I see some heads bobbing, but uh, go ahead and what do you, what do you think? Um, I think it also depends on every person. I think you need to find what works for you and what you can sustain for a long period of time. This is more of a lifestyle change that you'll have to integrate for our entire lives. So find something that works for you and, and just small, like a small bit in each of the areas will help. And I want to reiterate, um, again, with the disclaimer at the beginning, um, we're, we're not ourselves medical professionals. So a question like what kind of lifestyle change would be best for me might be something that is better to take up with your with your own doctor to see what's best for you because it isn't on an individual level, seeing where you're already at and where improvements can most easily be made. Any other questions? Anybody wanna jump in? All right. Well, seeing none, uh, I'll just uh, say my thanks to, to the students um, for making the time and putting together the presentation and, and answering our questions. Really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate the, uh, the seniors that have shown up as well. And um, I'm glad that we can sort of make these connect connections around the community. Um, and it's uh, an interesting explanation, um, an interesting perspective that you bring. Um, so uh, thank you all for showing up and um, maybe we'll be in touch again in the future here. Thank you. <clears throat> well done. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too.